see any uh, financial statement that we have we have given a balance sheet we are given a pnl statement we made a cash flow statement right now using these or if someone has already given all three statements to us forget about me making it because uh, even a cash flow statement is essential from a business standpoint so uh, let's say any public private company we got uh, some of the financial uh, statement and if we want to analyze how good is the company so there is a multi dimensional analysis that we typically look up which is one called as a common sizing analysis which is what uh, yesterday we tried out wherein we tried dividing every number by this revenues total revenues right we divided the uh, employee cost by the total revenues of that year profit by the total revenues of that year so every important value when i divide by the total revenues of that particular period we call that statement as a common size statement common size you are setting everything to for 1 rupee for 1 rupee of revenue every year though the revenues are different for each year if you make it in such a way that it is 1 rupee revenue and express everything in that percentage we call that as a common size so common size pnl statement common size balance sheet in balance sheet i divide everything by the total assets right because uh, the fine the big number is the total assets or total liabilities plus equity why any one of them so every item if i divide by that total it means out of total assets what proportion is of tangible assets what proportion is inventories what proportion is receivables now how does it help me it help me in seeing two three things one is it growing or falling over a period right probably if inventory is growing which means you are stocking up too much or you are not able to sell something see in absolute terms inventory can keep growing because business is growing you may say my inventory is also growing but in percentage terms if it is growing then it has a serious problem the i am able to stock more i am stocking more and more but i am not able to sell them fast my turn around time in terms of selling is taking too large right so from those standpoints it really helps us so let's see in our data can we make some kind of conclusions based on uh, based on these uh, pnl and uh, balance sheet so for these two years if i just want to see my pnl so these are my revenues right where is my pnl yeah these are so these are my total revenues these are my total revenues for two, two years so i want to see let's say materials what is the cost in percentage terms yes my materials are around 24 paisa per every rupee whereas uh, here they are close to 25.58 paisa which means my costs have gone up materials cost has gone up compared to the previous year employee benefits i can do the same thing my employee benefits 13% earlier whereas it has come down to 12.69 so probably employee cost has come down for every rupee any analysis if you see what did we do employee cost by revenues that number has come down the only way it can come down is either numerator should be numerator should be lesser compared to the denominator either it could indicate that employee efficiency has gone up right uh, one row the cost which have put up on the employee probably the revenues that are getting generated is much more so employee efficiency with small number of employees the company is able to generate more number of sales that kind of uh, analysis can uh, very well come out especially when the employee cost is coming up if i want to look at it on the negative side probably some layoff could have happened 
either way you can typically look at the employee cost employee to the sales ratio to the revenues ratio or the same way interest interest okay we know that in the case of interest interest is not an operations activity so i cannot comment too much on interest interest should always be with respect to the loan that is raised if the loan raise is higher probably the interest would be higher and vice versa right so interest we cannot comment much on it probably r and d is one more activity which we can comment as a proportion of the total revenues so this divided by this is saying almost 9.4% of the total revenues is being spent on r and d that has come down so the r and d expenditure has literally uh, come down for the company compared to the previous year now even the other expenses as we have listed a big set of expenses as other expenses and if i see those other expenses okay 21% earlier whereas they have gone to the extent of 22% now almost 1% increase in the other expense see 1% increase in an expense could means profit is down by 1% because of that so probably it's better to understand which of these items have contributed to that excess so what you can very well do you have the details of all the other expenses right you can keep side by side see which of them has literally gone up to pinpoint where where all the the company has really gone bad this year right see in the probably yes this may or may not be in the hands of the company inflation has gone up because of inflation it was not able to get the raw materials at lesser cost so it may not be in the hands of the company but this i need to really check why did i increase why why what was the, an increase in the other expenses which items have gone up drastically so wherever the difference is very high it is worth to understand the reason for going high and based on that take your appropriate action and finally uh, provisions if there are any also you can uh, look out for see anything that is going up it is having an impact on the profitability of the company something from 1% it has gone up to 2.8% so you can very well see what are constituting these things anything that is changing by more than 1% up or down down generally in expenses is more fine with me but again that should result in can it result in consistency even next year also can i maintain it at 8 point uh, employees cost can i maintain it at 12.69% or is it something they have done just a quick layoff or something there did something of that kind happen which has resulted in uh, employee cost going down so next year will it, uh, will it go up or will it go down i really have to start thinking from that direction see it has gone down but can it maintain at that or is it just for one year like this so if there is something solid that has resulted in reduction if there if i can identify why it has gone down and if there is a solid answer to that question then probably i can say next year also it can maintain the similar kind of down now the same thing for this i can say yeah probably the inflation is up so next year if someone can tell me if the inflation in india is going to be higher or lower if it is going to be still higher i may increase this number if the forecasts are saying it will come down then i'll decrease the number for the next year so if you see more or less all these uh, ratios they are in a small interval only they are not varying by wide margins but numbers are varying widely so number prediction is always a difficult thing the best thing as a part of your prediction in the budget also right percentage prediction is very easy because if you see the ratios are not the the, the areas are not much wider right so the prediction of the percentage is more easier compared to prediction of absolute number but once you have your percentage you can very well translate it back to original number if for next year let's say my employee benefit is going to be 12.69% itself 
12.69% of the total revenues. So if I have a mechanism just to predict the total revenues, rest all I can say percentage of the total revenues. So my P&L statement can get prepared very easily for the future. Only if I can predict total revenues for the next period. Total revenues can very well be predicted. Okay, what was the percentage increase compared to the previous year? And what was the typical growth that is forecasted for the industry, for the economy? If uh, some forecast said that uh, this uh, particular pharma industry in India will grow at 15%, Okay, simple example I am giving. Let's say last year someone has given a prediction saying pharma industry will grow by 15% or 10%. In when it was said that the pharma industry will grow by 10%, let's say Dr. Reddy's has grown by 20%, which means probably double. So now someone if he is predicting that uh, pharma industry will grow by 15% this year, probably I can very well assume that Dr. Reddy's may grow by 30%. Because I have been observing that compared to the forecast, the, the, the one single company is, because forecast is about the all companies. So some companies may be more than the average, some companies may be less than the average. So based on that, I can very well uh, say that probably this particular company may be growing at 25 or 30 percent. So based on that, I will get my total revenues for this period. Once I get the total revenues, rest all are percentage of the revenues itself. So I can make a P&L statement for the next. That is what is the typical budgeted statement. No, P&L statement we don't see percentages. Huh, this is the interpretation part of the P&L statement. This is called as common size P&L. Common size P&L is probably you are making a parallel P&L for your analysis. Wherein everything is in terms of percentage of the total revenues rather than in the dollar form, in the rupee form. You are arranging everything in percentage form, not in the rupees form. Right? Similarly, the total expenses, okay. Did my overall expenses go up? Go down. 80%. So, for every rupee, the company is getting 80 paisa is the expenses they are incurring. So, 20 paisa is the profit before tax for them. Now, what about in the recent uh, year? 81 and a half paisa. So, profit has come down by almost 1 and a half percent. Something that needs to be really looked at by the company. Why did, see, one, one item may go up slightly, one item may come down, but overall, if it gets impacted, it will have, now, for me, the next part is, is it the same for the whole industry? Are all pharma companies exhibiting the same kind of behavior? Right? Because, if it is common across all companies, I'm fine. Overall, pharma industry itself, probably the costs have gone up. So, Dr. Reddy's is also not an exception to that. So, probably the profitability for Dr. Reddy's also has gone down compared to... I mean, here gone down is not in absolute terms. In a percentage term, because everyone is bothered about... For one rupee, whatever is invested. Percentage return is what is most matters. Right? Uh, problem is for every one rupee of sales here we are making a here sales has gone up so profits will go up right it's as good as saying okay initially my sales were 100 simple numbers I am giving you initially my sales were 100 profit was 20 right next year my sales has uh, gone to 200 profit has gone to 22 Will I be fine with that? Both have gone. Both have gone up. Both have gone up. Sales has gone to 200. Profit has gone to let's say 25. So overall, as a person, see why did the sales go up to 200? Because I have invested more. I have invested more, so I have sold more. 
but now as an investor because i put more money i am getting more money but it is not commensurating the initial put up which i have done when i had put only 100 it was able to give me uh, 20 whereas when i am putting 200 it is giving me only 25 probably the next 100 which i have put it did not yield a good return for me the same logic uh, here overall profit see everyone is bothered about the profit only in percentage terms nowhere in absolute terms because as the company grows probably the profit also grows the business grows the revenues grow first profits grow everything grows all expenses grow everything is growing because the size of the business is growing so the comparative figure always is in percentage terms by what extent is my profit increasing because not not all 100% of the money is put by one person so every person has put some 1000 rupees so if the profit though it has increased what uh, what we are saying if the if the increase in the profit is much lesser whatever compared to the investment the person has put the return that he is getting is much lesser now so it's as good as probably instead of getting a 15% profit by investing in it i am getting a 10% profit then he'll start thinking why not i put my money in fd why should i look at dr reddy's for that the simple logic fd is fully secure the value will not be lost right only when i get some higher return when i think the prospects of getting a higher return is there then only i think of investing in that particular company so the profitability that's the reason the companies want to keep the profitability at a very high level and uh, profitability you should not look at it in absolute because the sales has gone up the profit also is going up profit also is going up but what is more bothering for me is percentage what is uh, going on uh, here is in terms of percentage right so my profit it is nothing but profit before tax divided by the total revenue overall profit before tax oh sorry around 19.39% is the profit before tax last year whereas this year it has gone to 18.46% almost 1% drop close to 1% drop in the profit so 1% drop means probably the investor psychology also is like that ki if some other company in this industry let's say sun pharma or sipla or someone else ran back see if they have increased this number they will direct all the funds from here to this they'll sell off the shares of dr reddys they'll buy the shares of someone else that's the typical investor psychology so from that standpoint only companies want to maintain this percentage at a decent level every year right so when you analyze it so otherwise it shows me that yes profits are improved everything is improved compared to the previous year so probably it's worth continuing but only when i do a percentage kind of an analysis of course still it is not bad for me but what i am saying is i cannot take a decision just with this number i am comparing one i have compared it with the last year which has shown there is a decrease do i prefer comparing it with my competitors the same analysis i can do for four five other main companies which are competing with this see if uh, the percentages are anywhere good or bad for those companies and if they are much different from this probably the preference will go to those companies compared to this as far as the investments are concerned right because the expectation is this company is going to perform much better compared to the other companies in the list 
So sometimes people take an industry average, which is nothing but five six companies, ten companies. They do an average of all those ten companies numbers, and based on that, see all the companies which are above that average, they'll consider them for buying purpose. Below the average, they'll consider them for selling purpose. If they already have the shares of those companies, they try to sell them off. So that's the reason a quarterly result or an annual result of a company. has a very big impact on the performance of the share on the share price also the day they are announcing their annual results or something you will find that the share price fluctuations are more higher the reason being this the moment they announce it people will find out this kind of percentages and all if they find for some other competitors the numbers are higher compared to this they immediately switch their investments So this is what we do on a P&L statement. The same thing I can do on a balance sheet also. Probably uh, it's more like this. Now, if I see on the asset side, okay, what is happening to my total gross uh, tangible assets? Okay, my tangible assets are eighteen percent of my total assets. now they have become again more or less the same if we see which mean next year if i have to predict also i can very well predict that it will be around 18.3% or 18 somewhere some average of these two i can take i can say it would be around 18% my total asset should be around 18% 18.3% of my total asset now i can find out what would be the total assets if at all how can i decide the total assets total assets are primarily based on how much sales you are going to generate because uh, if you want to generate this much of sale if your target is this much right you need to produce this much if you have to produce this much you need this much of uh, inventory you need this much of uh, 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 machineries you need to invest in all these things so which is what is resulting in these all being proportional to the total amount of sale which you are going to make so once you know what should be your total asset you can very well decide the break up between the totals now even if i see on the other terms let's say intangibles of course they don't have any value so we don't need to bother about those small values they are hardly going to impact anything for us but if you look at the capital work in progress around 5% or around 6% even this year it's the same around 5 point uh, probably if i convert all these into percentages you see 5.89 5.91 where there is not much of a big difference at all so and probably investments yeah investments have actually come down initially last year they were 26% whereas this year they have become only 22% so they have sold off some of the investments so i need to see whether this change in investment drop in the investment where exactly it is increasing if it is increasing in current as in cash or something fine i mean instead of investing it they are holding it in the form of cash right if, if the, so if you see here investments have gone down which means they are not investing in some other companies they have they did not increase the investments in some other companies in proportion to their total assets whereas the loans and advances okay they stopped giving high loans also which was almost 9.84% now it has come only to 6% so they stopped the loans also they are not giving loans to their subsidiaries and all they almost reduced the percentage of those so looking at the total fixed assets the total fixed assets is almost 60% whereas uh, here it has become only 52 so they are they have reduced their weightage of fixed assets right long term assets they have reduced their weightage and they have probably increased the weightage in the current assets so they are more maintaining in the form of current assets rather than long term kind of investment so here also the important thing is i will compare with my competitors what are the competitors numbers 
are they much in the so they have put almost two percent of their money in current investment so probably if they combine these two these are two different investments only right this is a non current investment this is a current investment so both are investment somewhere else so it totally came to almost 24 percent Earlier there were around 26 and a half percent. So overall it was reduced only by two and a half percent. The total investment they got reduced by two and a half. Instead of looking for long term, they are looking for short term right now. So two percent of their total uh, assets they have put under the short term kind of investment. Now this is the most important aspect: inventory. 11.4 percent of the total assets was in the form of inventory in the first year. And in the second year, it became 12.84. Inventories have gone up by almost 1.5%. Right? Which means the company is stocking more and more of the goods for every $1, of, for every one rupee of the asset. Inventories are getting stocked up more and more. Now, again, the comparison should happen with the competitor. How is the competitor doing the same job? If for him, because every inventory means there is a storage cost, there, there could be some spoilage, some fire, these kind of risks and thefts and these kind of things are there whenever you are storing. So there is some extra cost that is incurred for that, which will again reduce the profitability of the company. So you have to see inventory is that very high compared to the competitors or very low compared to the competitors. So some space to focus on. Receivables, how good is your collection? Right, receivables is amount to be collected from the customers. Almost 19% is in the form of receivables, whereas 18. So probably it has come down, though in the numbers, it is showing it has gone up. But in the percentage terms, this is slightly lesser, which means your collections have slightly improved. Right, which is a good sign. Because you are able to collect the cash slightly better. Similarly, if I am looking at in the form of cash, cash position has improved quite drastically. 0.71% vis-a-vis 8.2%. So, the cash has actually gone up drastically in the overall proportion, which is, okay, the company can use it for some other purposes. Whereas, the short-term loans, they have loans wise they stopped giving lesser 6.2 percent and it has become 5 point so even in the long term loans the percentage has gone down in the short term loans also the percentage has gone down so they stopped giving or they are reducing slowly year over year the amount that can that they can give in the form of loans to various uh, subsidiaries and all It will go into the cash flow. That's what has the, the, these all these all downfalls have resulted in an increase in the cash. There is almost a one percent drop here. Long term, almost three percent, three and a half percent drop. Investments, another three percent drop. These are all like see the, the drops are not on core areas. In the core means to a business, inventory is a core. Inventory did not drop. Inventory has actually gone up. Right? See, investments are something external to the company. Some other companies have invested. Right? So, investments have dropped, which means I did not invest, I am just maintaining the cash in my pocket. Loans, I did not give loan to my, uh, those guys. It's also like an investment, right? Giving a loan to a subsidiary is also like an investment. So, only thing it is looking like is, I am not giving loans or investments to other parties. That entire money I have maintained it in the form of cash itself. If I give loans, probably my cash would have gone down. So I have reduced the loans and maintaining it in the form of cash. But the real benefit will come if this has gone down drastically and cash has increased. This did not go drastically, right? Only 0.3%. It was not a significant drop. Or 0.2%. No, 0.3%. 19.11 to 18.81. So, it's only a 0.3% drop. Right? Uh, and even this has actually gone up. These are the core of the business. They did not go down drastically. If they have gone down drastically and cash has improved, then I would have uh, seen that it's a much betterment. 
Whereas, okay, instead of investing somewhere else, I have maintained it in the form of cash. If I look at it like this, you see here, almost a 4.5% drop. This is a 4.5% drop. This is a 3.5% drop, 8% drop. This is a 2% up, 6% drop. These are all outside to the company, right? This is another 1% drop, 7% drop. And even this. From 1.89, we are talking about point almost 1, 8% drop almost. The 8% drop is in the non-core areas of the business. So, and there was an 8% increase in the cash. So, probably if they had invested that money, there would not have been much of a difference at all. But the major thing always for analysis is, if there is any big difference in either this, if there is any major difference in either this or this, or this, or these two, which are the real core of the business, right? If there is any major improvement in these two, in these few, that would have a real big impact on the business in the later terms. Because they are the core activities of the business, the tangible assets, intangible assets, they are used for producing or sales, uh, they, they actually help us in sales of the business. A good machine can produce more, which could reduce, result in more sales. So, there is some kind of an operational aspect that is involved in them. Whereas, these, all these, I am investing in some other company. I have bought some other mutual funds. This is more of, just because I have some excess money, I am doing that. Right? Which one? Uh, if they come down, no, I mean, if they, if they are significantly different, see, at least these inventories and receivables should come down drastically. Right? Even if this has gone up, the tangible assets, even if they go up, it should result in sales going up accordingly. If the revenues are going up accordingly, no issues. Right? If the revenues are mounting up accordingly, then no issues at all. So, that is one thing which we will uh, look at in couple of other ratios which we will analyze. The same thing in the p in this uh, in this aspect also, I am more bothered about the payables. Again, just like the inventory and receivables, I am even more bothered about the payables also. What was the situation with the payables? 8.7%. And in this year, it was only 7 point some percent. Now, even this also, I will uh, express them in the percentage format. So, from 8.7, it has resulted in 7.1, the payables, which means it can indicate that I am paying faster, right, which means I am blocking my money. If I pay faster, See, receiving earlier, paying faster. Receiving earlier is happening because this has come down slightly. Right? Receiving faster. Paying also faster. Number of payables have actually come down. Which means no outstanding. Outstanding is actually dropping. Outstanding to be paid to my vendors. So, either I am paying faster or they are collecting faster from me. Whatever it is. Right, that's a uh, that that that's something. Probably, if I have good demand in the market, I should extend the credit period by some extent. So that proportion will be a very important aspect for us to look at. And other liabilities, if at all they are there, we are seeing what is the proportion: six point three to almost uh, nine point five. So there, on the other aspect. There are something, some to employees or some other things that are outstanding from the company's side. That is where the company is actually increasing in those particular aspects. So, these are couple of things that we typically uh, analyze once we make our 
common size balance sheet or a common size uh, P&L statement. But remember, all the comparisons on a common size uh, analysis, they cannot be talked at in isolation. Probably if you have at least last five years data, see the trend. How each of these percentages is varying. Is it more or less constant, just plus or minus something? Or is there a significant up or a significant down? When I say significant up or down, even if there is a 2 to 3 percent difference in the percentage, right? Like one is 18 percent, the other is 22 percent. Then it's something worth for analysis. What is actually causing a big difference here? Otherwise, what we see is hardly there will be a 1 or 2 percent difference uh, across all the various years, which means the same percentages I can use for the prediction purposes also for the later years. So, uh, probably if all these, if you see here, the percentage is more or less same. This is more or less same. This is more or less same. So, percentage wise I can put, this will be the percentage per next year. Percentage of total assets. So, probably the moment I can forecast the total assets for the next year, the breakup is something which is already known. So that's how the typical uh, predictions will happen when people create financial models or budgeting exercises kind of stuff, right? Uh, the, the percentages when you are comparing over a period of time, you call that as a trend analysis. Is it either growing up or falling down or whatever it is. So if it is growing up, probably every year you will keep slightly increasing, otherwise slightly decreasing. More or less, if it is fluctuating, you will keep it as an average figure. Right? Then, apart from the common size analysis, people also try to compare a few important ratios. Though there is no end to these ratios, but the most common ones which can help in evaluating the performance of the company are generally looked at from a profitability perspective. From a profitability standpoint, how good is this company? From an efficiency standpoint, how good is it? From a liquidity standpoint, how good is it? Liquidity is the availability of cash. From a liquidity standpoint, how good is it? And from a solvency standpoint, like bankruptcy. From a, from a bankruptcy or a solvency standpoint, possibility of defaulting or from a bankruptcy standpoint, what is it? And from an investor standpoint, how do I look at it? So, there are multiple dimensions where uh, the most common ratios which people typically uh, compute in this space are these, which based on which they do some level of analysis. So, probably if I try out, so what I can do here is, I will put uh, the formulas here and uh, for, for uh, the two years, let us see. So, when I say return on equity, one important thing which every investor will or more from an investor's perspective because return on equity for every rupee which is invested by the investor which is for every 1 rupee that is present in the company, share capital or shareholders fund, for every 1 rupee of shareholders fund, how much profit is the company generating? If it is more, it means I can expect that I will get more money as an investor because for every 1 rupee which I have put up in the company, what is the profit that it has generated? So, probably I will uh, call it as profit after tax divided by shareholders funds. Profit after tax divided by shareholders funds, if I do it for the first year, profit after tax which is this one, divided by the shareholders funds is this one. So, what does it mean? 14.84 percent. What does this mean? For every one rupee that was invested in the company, 
by the investors this company generated 14.84 percent profit so if you have uh, for every uh, 100 rupees you have invested the company's profit is 14.84 rupees it means at the max even if it gives all the profit to you you will get 14 percent now, which means uh, it's as good as like if you put the money in the bank, you may get 10%. But if you are putting it here, you are getting 14%. Every year, the profit that the company is generating on the capital that is existing is around 14.84%. Now, if that percentage has gone down, which means uh, almost by 1%, there is a drop in the profit. So, whatever as an investor, even if, see, if the company is not giving this yet, see, all the profit the company need not give, right? Because it will retain some portion of the profit and it may give the dividend only. But that portion of the profit which it is retaining, it's going as additional capital for the next year. So, as long as the percentage is a good number for me, I don't mind even if the company retains that. It does not give to me in the form of dividend, even if it is uh, even if it is retaining that. As long as this percentage is good enough, investor will not mind keeping his investment with the company. Only when there is a drop, the investor is having issues with the company. Yeah, that's a total of, because that's also a shareholder's capital, right? That, that's also a shareholder's money which is getting invested every year. The profit part actually should go to the shareholders, but it is not going and it is getting reinvested back into the company as additional capital. So, we are, uh, so which means, means totally till today, the shareholders have put that 60 or 6,000 crores or 6,700 crores till today as a part of investment in the company. So, the total capital that is present in the company of the shareholders is this much. Whereas, out of this, the company was able to generate a profit of only this much. Now, the biggest thing for me to compare is this number, one of the key things for lot of investment decisions. If the ROE is higher, people go ahead investing in the company. ROE is low. It's as good as you can compare it to the return which you are getting if you put your money somewhere else. If you put your money, uh, let's say in a FD, you are getting 8-9% return. But in the company, you are getting 13% return. Right? If this number comes down slightly, but of course, you are taking a risk. If this year, you have got it but next year you may or may not get it so th that's a risk that is taken across so the higher the roe people will keep their investments in that company for safer again it should be much higher compared to what you get on your fds and those kind of stuff otherwise the so the higher it is above that return that that company would be preferred heavily compared to any other company so typically when you start your investment, you will see which company is having this uh, higher ROE kind of stuff. And after that, before you, uh, if you see that every year the ROE is uh, maintained or going up, you will continue your investment. The moment you see in a particular quarter the ROE is falling drastically, you will exit out of your investments. So, ROE is one powerful from a profitability standpoint. Then similarly, net profit margin is the other dimension which we have already seen earlier. The As per the percentage, uh, as per the common size, we have done this net profit margin paired by total revenues. The total profit after tax by total revenues, which we have done in the, uh, in the common size analysis. Every item we have divided by the total revenue, right? So, the final profit when I am dividing, it gives me the profit, uh, the net profit margin. So, this divided by this. So, overall the net profit of the company is uh, 
whereas that also has dropped to 13.3 percent. So you see the profits have gone down. So for even for a rupee of sales also, the profit of the company has gone down. Now this I have to see whether it's the same for all the companies in the industry or is it a specific problem of Dr. Reddy's? If it is a specific problem, then it's a serious concern for me. If it is for all and there was a projection that the market, the industry also is not, our market is not that good for the pharma industry, then it's not a big issue because next year when the market rises, probably Dr. Reddy's also will rise. Not a big issue. But if all others have increased and if this has fallen, that comes out as a big issue for us. Right? So, this ratios will help us in doing a much better analysis on the health of the company. Similarly, this return on capital employed. So, I will look at the total profit before tax divided by the total capital, which is nothing, or profit before tax. Probably let me look at it like this. Profit after tax plus interest divided by the shareholders funds plus long term debt, which is nothing but Total capital is what? The equity capital and the loans. The equity capital and the loans. Long term loan. So, because short term loan within no time you will, uh, so it's not a big capital to the business. So, it's only because on that day there is something that is outstanding, you have to show it in the balance sheet, but within no time that becomes a zero again. But it's not the case with the long term capital. Long term capital is per you might have taken a loan for few years period. So, that is actually used as a big capital in the business, right? So, when you are trying to find out the total capital employed, we say both shareholders funds as well as the long term debt. So, for the shareholders, the profit means profit after tax. And for the loan, the profit is interest. Because for a loan, you don't give anything more or anything less. Even though you generate more profit, you will pay a fixed amount only for the bank. Even though your profits are lesser also, you will pay that fixed amount only. So, what you are paying to the bank, what you are paying to the shareholder is fat. I mean, you can pay the whole fat. That money belongs to them. Whether you pay it or not, that is your dividend policy. But it's as good as, as I said, you paid it to them. And you have collected it back from them. So, it as good as you have paid to them. Right? So, you have paid PAT to the equity investor. And you are paying interest to the loans. Right? Loan capital, you have paid an interest. Equity capital, you have paid the PAT. All are portion of the PAT. Portion of the PAT is nothing but you paid all PAT and you have collected some money back. So, what is the total return on all these? Both the, the debt capital as well as the equity capital that is coming into the company. So, if I am looking at this number, it is PAT plus the finance cost, which is the interest, divided by Shareholders funds plus the long term borrowings. So it says around 13.75%, whereas here it is 13.5. More or less, here there is not much of a difference. The overall difference 13.76% to 13.51, which means overall, whether it is lenders or equity investors on a company, this is a very important uh, word also which is also called as weighted average cost of capital. What does this mean is, see if a company is, this is the capital that is provided to the company. 
some portion is by the equity investors some portion is by the lenders banks right now this number what it says is the average cost of this two capital because for the equity capital the cost to the company is it has to give some dividend for the loan capital the cost to the company is it has to pay the interest these are the two costs to the company so what it is saying is on an average weighted average cost of capital WACC what does that mean is on an average for every one rupee that the company got for the business company as I said it's an independent entity for every one rupee that the company got for its business from various sources it has to pay 13.51 paisa to those investors it has to pay 13.51 paisa to them which means every project which the company undertakes should give a return of more than 13.51 percent getting this see you have given me 100 right let's say you you are a shareholder you are a lender whatever it is you have given me all together you have given me 100 and your expectations are uh, and for the money which you have given i am paying you something you in the form of interest you in the form of uh, let's say dividend i am paying you guys something so that is the cost for me it is a it is a return for you guys but for me it's a cost i am a company for me it's a cost now that cost for me is 13.51 percent right because you are charging let's say 14 you are charging 12 whatever you are charging overall it is costing me 13.5 per 1 rupee for you i am paying 14 for you i am paying 12 whatever it is overall for every 1 rupee that is coming to me i am paying 13.51 paisa to all of you which means how can i pay you 13.51 paisa whatever the money i took from you if i can do my business which can generate more than 13.51 paisa right if i can do the business which can generate 14 or 15 then i can be pay you 13.5 and i can still be profitable getting the logic so that is what is the meaning of this cost of capital the minimum return which the companies should look at in the execution of their project the interest A company and entity you have funded the company in a equity form like a partner you have funded in the form of loan so different people have given some money to this company so this company has to pay back to them whether he is a equity investor or a lender doesn't matter the company because it is separate from its owner it has to pay to the owner it has to pay to the lender everyone it has to pay now the owner is expecting 13.6 percent return the shareholder is expecting 13.6 percent return and a lender he might have fixed at what rate uh, interest he requires what uh, at what rate he is giving the loan he might very well specify how much interest he wants if he is giving some loan so overall capital that I got from various sources, probably the equity guy, 14%, lender, he said 12%, overall, if I take the average of all these guys, at least I need to give 13.5% to everyone. To some people more than 13.5, to some people less than 13.5, but more or less on an average, I have to give 13.5 to everyone. How can I give 13.5? I don't have anything in for myself, right? Whatever I got is from you guys as a company. The only way I can give you is if I can generate, if I can do my business. I am a business into, I am into the business of pharmaceutical. So if I can do my business, I get my clients. 
in such a way that the business which I do with my clients gives me more than 13.5% return, then only I can fund you with 13.5%. Otherwise, I cannot fund. Correct? Only if I can generate more than what you have given, then only I can give you that much. That means every assignment which I am taking up, minimum should give me a return of 13.5%. So any project that is coming in my way, which will give me only 5% or 8% uh, return, I will reject that project. Okay. Now the other side to look at from the company standpoint is efficiency. The efficiency is talking of how effectively the company is using its resources like inventories, how effectively it is managing them. They are the assets of the company, how effectively is it managing them, which means one of the important ratios from that standpoint is average inventory turnover period. What does that mean is, on an average, how many days it is taking for my inventory to get converted into sales? On an average, how many days it is, so some of them may be sold immediately, some of them may be sold after 40 days. So on an average, how many days is it taking my inventory to get converted into sales? So the higher is the number of days, probably the weaker is the inventory management process. Probably some improvement is very much required in that. So for that what the formula which they generally do is, the inventory divided by cost of goods or sales, invited inventory divided by sales or revenues, inventory divided by total revenues into 365, number of days, which means approximately or you can keep it in percentage terms also, no issues approximately, so just to find out on an average how many days it is taking, we are using the word, on an average how many days is it taking for my inventory to get converted into sales. So that's the reason why we are multiplying it by 365. So it is telling me here the inventory divided by total revenues into 365. So on an average it is taking 71 days for my inventory to get converted into sales. Now also almost 71 days. So which means uh, it is taking, I mean again whether it is high or not we cannot comment because it could be the industry behavior itself. As I said lot of goods have to be stocked at various medical shops. They may take so much of time to get sold and whatever. So it is showing that it's like on an average it is taking around, uh, last year it was taking almost 71 and a half days. Now it is taking around 71 days. So the moment, some of them, see some medicines could turn out within 5 days to 2 days itself. Some of them may take 1 year. So on an average it is taking around 71 days. Again, the comparison of all these ratios is with respect to the competitors itself. Competitors and past, only that is the way to compare. There is no way to say this is high, this is less. Because if I talk about probably a, a fast-moving consumer goods industry, FMCG industry like a HUL or someone, this ratio must be much lesser. Or probably if I am uh, looking at uh, a, a motors company, automobile company, this number may be much lesser. So, depending on a business, we may have to make a comment and that comment always has to be with respect to the competitors, the, the, the past itself. So, if I see here, there is not much of a difference, hardly half a day decrease. So, decrease is like an improvement itself, right? So, probably here it was showing things were slightly bad, inventories has actually gone up. But now this is telling me inventories has gone up, 
but sales has gone even more than that inventory has gone up but the revenues has gone even more than that which has neutralized this going up that's the reason the inventory turnover days has come down by even a half a day otherwise even that should have gone up but if it has gone down so if i club these three a statement is coming up okay the company is maintaining a higher inventory but it's not for wrong reasons that higher inventory maintenance is still resulting in sales improvement revenues getting uh, improved and because which is reflected by the average inventory number of days getting reduced by half a day so it's not that one ratio is high means it's a wrong impact i have to link the chain right is it resulting in more sales if it has resulted in more sales probably the inventory number of days is actually coming down a half a day improvement but still i don't know whether it is good or bad that can be looked at only with the competitors but at least with the past there is an improvement for last one compared to last one year there is an improvement similarly average settlement period for receivables how good is my cash collection process from my customers on an average how many days i am taking to collect cash from my customers if it is a cash sale zero days immediately i am collecting for credit sale some number of days so we are taking again on an average how many number of days again the higher the number of days the weaker is my collection process the lesser the stronger is my collection process so the same thing again i'll take it as trades receivable by total revenue into 365 so again i am doing it as trades receivable divided by total revenue into 365 almost 119 days it is taking to collect from my to collect from my customers but yeah it has gone down comparatively there is some improvement with respect to the collection process but again we don't know this industry probably this is the attributes of this industry so we have to do the comparison only with the competitors before make a, may we make a comment probably if i compare it with the same if i compare it with a, a maruti suzuki probably maruti suzuki may be having much lesser numbers here so we cannot say maruti suzuki is efficient compared to dr reddy because that has to be more looked at from a industry standpoint from from a competitor standpoint because some industries they don't even uh, get into credit sales at all if they don't get into credit sales at all obviously this numbers will be much much lesser right so, so uh, whereas some industries credit sales is the most important thing for them right so it has to be looked at only from a comparison standpoint even the same thing here payables also so how much time you i am taking typically to pay to my vendors on an average how many days i am taking to pay to my vendors some vendors i may do an immediate payment cash payment kind of thing if i am taking a credit payment again i may take some days to pay to my vendor so on an average how many days i am taking trade payables by revenue into 365 this divided by this into 365 so on an average i am paying off in 54 days itself so you see there is some issue i am paying much much faster i am collecting in 103 days but i am paying in 39 days which is not a good cash management here right probably if i collect early and pay late i have cash protection rotation and uh, available in my system but otherwise my cash shortage will come out here right i am paying early but i am getting late which is an indicator that probably that is the requirement for that is the need for me to borrow in the short term because i am not having the cash generated available in the short term quite comfortably 
So these three together, if I look at and analyze, it will tell me how good is the cash available in the system for a shorter period. And couple of things other we are looking at, how much sales the company generated to the total capital that is invested. So for every one rupee that is invested in the company in the form of share capital or shareholders fund, how much sale? So if the sales is going up, that ratio is going up means for every one rupee, the company is selling more than one rupee. One rupee invested, the company, but by how much? The higher the number is, the better it is. Right? The company with small amount of capital, it is doing a big amount of sales. Right? So that's where I will talk about total revenues divided by total capital employed, which is shareholders capital plus long term funds. So I'm I'm taking it as total revenues divided by the shareholders capital plus the long term loans. So it is saying almost 0.83. So it's not even uh, full. But it has improved. For every 1 rupee which people have invested in the company, the company is able to sell for 94 paisa. Right? The higher it is, the better it is. Some cases it may so happen if the company is doing much better, the number will be more than 1 also. Which means though the capital is uh, 1000 crores, it has created a sales of 1200 crores. These things are all. That will talk about very efficiency of the company. Right? Probably if you see some, of, some other industries, you may see this ratio to be much, much higher also. You may see 1.52 also for this ratio, which is an indicator that for small, with small capital, company is able to generate higher volumes of sales also. And one more thing is, how good are the fixed assets being utilized? Fixed assets are more like your tangible, intangible. These fixed assets, to how much extent they are fully utilized. So typically uh, speaking, people will talk about it as total revenues divided by tangible assets plus intangible assets. Because they are the total fixed assets with which the business is being done. Using those, see fixed assets are nothing but your uh, machines and all with which you are actually generating your sale. So one rupee of investment you made in the fixed asset, how much of sales is it resulting in? So if it is resulting in more sales, then it is an indicator that, or probably here I will look at only the sales. I will not look at total revenue because the fixed assets are contributing only to the sales of the product, not the other incomes and all those stuff. So probably I will look at only the sales. Because other income and all are more to do with the investments and all. Only the fixed assets and tangibles and intangibles, they are contributing only to your uh, sales. Selling of the, uh, producing the goods which is resulting in the selling of the goods. So for every one room, which means I have invested in these things much better. This is a good investment. See, let's say I have bought a machine. If that machine is not able to produce good sales, so the investment that I have made in a machine, sales is much lesser. Probably I will say it's a very bad investment. But if the sales is improving compared to the investment that I am making, I will say the investment in the fixed assets is a very good investment. Right? So we will take it as sales divided by Total fixed and uh, variable, uh, fixed, sorry, total uh, tangible and intangible assets. So almost three times, three times the investment, but it has become three and a half times, which means there's a, the investment in the assets is much, much better, improved.
but again is it good or not can come only with the industry average or the competitors comparison so all these ratios so probably if i have to give some conclusion about the efficiency of the company i may say yes payables sorry the receivables have improved inventory position has improved payables slightly the company may have to look at if it can negotiate some terms with the vendors to slightly delay the payment whereas uh, the other things uh, the sales revenue to the percentage capital they have improved and even in terms of efficiency related to good usage of the fixed asset even from that standpoint there is an improvement so overall efficiency of the company is much better compared to the previous year i can't say that it is the best then i will compare it with the competitors then i will compare it uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, past even couple of more years to see if it has if it has created an all time record compared to the previous years in any of these items then the third dimension that we are looking at here is the liquidity cash right typically the current ratio talks about current assets by current liabilities because what does this mean here see i have current assets which are meant in the next one year i am going to get cash out of them i already have cash or they will be converted into cash very quickly current liabilities are i have to pay within the next one year so within the next one year is my company comfortable to pay all the obligations all the obligations of the next one year how comfortable is the company to pay them right current assets see long term assets they may not give you money in the next one year right whereas current assets can give you cash within the next one year whereas you still have some obligations to pay within the next one year so will the cash coming from here is sufficient to pay there ah if that is not the case then you have to borrow right so we are primarily looking at how good i mean current assets as a proportion of current liabilities are they really good see if i have something more at least two times if my current liabilities are 100 if my current assets are 200 probably yes i'll get the 200 i have to pay 100 i still have some cash with me but if they are very tight this is 100 this is 120 it may so happen that if this have to be paid earlier but this is coming later because we are talking of one year we are not so that one year could be two days or 364 days so if the payments have to be much earlier than the receipts then for the short period i may have to do a borrowing so that's where we see on an average at least if this number is higher 1.5 1.7 1.8 kind of stuff or even 2 plus it is slightly more comfortable for a company so from that standpoint we are looking at current assets this is the total current assets divided by the total current liabilities which is saying almost 1.4 times and things have improved a little bit 1.6 so the company has decent i mean it is comfortable in terms of paying in terms of paying uh, to its uh, obligations within the next one year the higher it is the better it is but again too much higher also is not that good and that too especially if there is a huge money in form of cash it is not that good the reason being when your other current assets are comfortable enough to convert into current to to pay off the current liabilities what are you doing with the idle cash cash in your bank account doesn't give anything right probably if you had put it in some investments short term investments or long term investments something it will fetch you some extra return for you so from that standpoint too much of cash or too much higher this ratio like 3 plus or something it is not advisable it means you are not able to do a proper cash management in your company so 1.5 plus up to 2 and 1/2 to 2 and 1/2 fair enough but anything more than that probably you are not doing your cash management very effectively 
If you put that in investment, long term investment, obviously cash will come down, current assets will come down. Cash is coming down, right? If you are putting that money in long term investments, non current investment, non current investments are going up, cash is coming down. Uh, so your current assets are coming down. Cash is a part of current assets. Current assets are coming down, the ratio is coming down. So at least if the company has 3, 3 and a half plus kind of a ratio, that is the suggestion that is being given. Invest it slightly better because you don't need that much of cash just kept in your bank account. Correct. Then a slightly better ratio than current sometimes is the quick ratio where inventories are there for the company. Everything is same. You only look at uh, the current assets minus in because inventories generally see if they are in the form of raw materials. You have to finish convert them into a product then sell then get cash. They will take too much of a time to give you cash. Right. So, because they have to go into production, then they have to. So, because of this reason, generally while computing uh, the quick ratio, we will look at, if I remove inventories and look at the kind of current ratio, it's like current ratio without inventories. Because inventories generally may take a long time. See, we are talking of one year. But inventories may come, may give you money probably after 200 days or something. Right, probably if you see here, inventories are taking almost 71 days to get converted into sales. After sales to get cash, another 119 days. So, the inventory to give you cash, it's almost 190 days. You are getting the cash out of your inventory almost after 190 days. Right, which is, so in the meanwhile, you have to pay within 54 days. To your uh, vendors, you have to pay within 54 days. But with your inventory, you are getting the money after 190 days. So, what will you do for that 140 days? You have to borrow for that 140 days. That is where the problem will come up. So, that is where what we are looking at is, how is my quick ratio? Is it at least more than one? Because all others generally get converted into cash faster not in this case, anyhow, here uh, receivables are also taking too much of time to get converted. But in most of the companies, what you will see is, this number will be very, very less. So, it's as good as quick conversion itself. But in this example, at least for this company, it is taking too much of a time, which means they, they might work too much on credit basis. Right? But uh, for the quick ratio, if I see, the total current assets minus inventories and if I divide that by current liabilities you see this ratio is 0 0.99 and 1.17 just decent enough you know? 1 plus is expected at least here just around that number only which means it's not too high too low but somewhere it may create a small short term cash flow crisis problem because uh, these numbers are much faster compared to these numbers. You are, you are receiving the money very late, but you are paying it very early. So that is the only reason what, what, what uh, can result in your cash flow problem. right? Otherwise, your quick ratio is also fine. Current ratio is also okay enough. So liquidity is not a big problem. But for some companies, what happens is current assets are very, very less, whereas the current liabilities will be very, very high. In those cases, a mandatory borrowing is required. Right? Then, if I have to talk about the solvency of the company, see, generally the bankruptcy issues or solvency issues of any company will come up because the company is not able to pay the debt. Only the inefficiency of the company to pay the debt is what will create a solvency issue. If the company does not have any debt, there is no question of solvency at all. 
there is no question of bankruptcy at all. Bankruptcy is associated with inability to pay debt. Because shareholders, even if they get zero, they should not talk about the company. That's as per the behavior of the shareholder itself. That's as per the uh, definition of the shareholder itself. So only guys who can raise something about the company are the lenders. So they will file for the bankruptcy of the company. If the company is not able to pay the loan, then only we call it as bankruptcy. So for companies like Infosys, which are zero debt companies, there is no question of bankruptcy for them. Whereas on the other hand, a company like Kingfisher, where everything is debt and the equity is much lesser, there is a high chance of bankruptcy, which we are observing it today. Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that not every company which has a debt has is well exposed to bankruptcy because with that debt if they can generate sales and uh, generate profits to pay the interest comfortably every year no issues with the company right but what we are saying is if the debt proportion is very high compared to the equity proportion one or two bad years one or two bad uh, economic situation will result in a huge downfall of the company even the bigger companies like Lehman Brothers or Whatever got collapsed, one point in time they were the cream companies, but because of the heavy debt which they have engaged in their business, one or two bad economic years, they had to go out of the business. That's the biggest uh, problem with the proportion of debt that the company will maintain. So if any company which has al it has already having very high debt, the simple uh, uh, assessment is the ratings of that company will come down. Right. So, from that standpoint, even in our case, we can write it as the loan or long-term debt divided by shareholders' equity. If it is much, much lesser, close to zero, then it means probably uh, the, bank is, the, the company is more and more safe from everyone's standpoint. But if this ratio is more high, let's say one and a half or two plus, which means loan is twice that of the equity. From there, the risk starts. So in this company's case, because they don't have loan at all, very minor loan, only, only very minute kind of a loan is what is there with the company. Debt to equity ratio is only 0 0.09 and 0 0.08. So they, have, they don't have debt at all. See, look at this debt. 5130 whereas equity is 60,000. Debt is a very small value when it compares with the equity of them. But in some cases, Kingfisher case, this is 7,000. This is 700. So that's the kind of riskiness that comes out with the company. Then, now, this is one important thing which actually banks look at, interest coverage ratio which is nothing but PBT PBT plus interest divided by interest. So what is, see, basically out of the profit only the interest is paid. So I am seeing before the interest is paid, what is the profit? So if the profit, uh, so the profit before tax is this much, before interest. Profit before tax, before interest. How much is it? Divided by what is the interest that needs to be paid. If this ratio is more than 1.2 or 1.3 or up to 1.5 plus, banks think there is no problem with this company we can very well give additional loan to them. See, mostly for the projects and all, when I, when I go for a loan for my project, the first thing they look at in my financial statement is the interest coverage ratio, which is nothing but, can, this, can the profits of the company cover the interest? How comfortable the company's operations are to pay the interest of the company? 
So the higher the number is, the better it is. At least it should be 1.2, 1.5. Banks will look at it with that kind of a number. So if I look at it here, PBT plus interest divided by interest because the interest is almost not existing. I need 1 plus. This company is having 199 plus. So because there is no debt to the company, no interest much. So companies don't mind giving more uh, loans to this company. It has at least 20 plus it is there. Anything 1 plus, 1.5 plus, I will look at it as comfortable. I don't mind giving loan to this company. Because they have so much of assets, they have so much of equity capital with them. Even if I give some additional loan to them, they cannot default. Or even if they default, I can recover through something else. So from a bank standpoint, these are the safest companies to give the loans. Those companies who have the interest cover more than 1.5 at least, they are the safest companies to give the loan. And this company is 20 plus. So no tension at all to give the loan for this kind of a company. Whereas for some companies, this may not be even 1 plus. Then they are the companies which are quite heavy risky. And the bank has to think twice before it gives the loan because the chance of bankruptcy is much higher for those kind of companies. right? And finally, uh, looking at uh, the investment perspective, we are looking at few things. How much dividend is the company paying? Right? What proportion of its profit is paid in the form of a dividend? So, which is coming out as dividend by PAT. Profit after tax. Out of the profit after tax only, the company is paying the dividend. So, typically this is coming out as dividend divided by profit after tax. So last year they have paid almost 91% of their profit in the form of dividend which means they retained only 9% of the profit. Whereas this year, I mean in 2012, they have paid only 24% of the profit in the form of dividend. Remaining they have retained. Probably they must be identifying some growth opportunities in the business. So, instead of raising capital from outside, they thought internal capital itself could contribute to the growth. But this is one more thing which you have to see comparison with the competitors. How are the competitors given? Did they generate everything in the form of dividend or did they give something like this only? Whereas the other thing from an investor standpoint is the dividend yield, which is nothing but dividend per share divided by price per share, which is the market price. What is the market price of? Or probably you can call it as dividend by market capitalization. Market capitalization is nothing but the number of shares that are available in the market multiplied by the share price which is the total market value of the company, which can be obtained from any of those stock market stuff. Probably if I just visit, if I just visit a site like Money Control or something, which talk about the stock price every day. So if I check out for the current stock price of Dr. Reddy's, You will get the market capitalization of the company here. So this is the market capitalization. But this is in crores. But our data I think is in millions. So probably add one more uh, decimal here. That will make it into million. So 3796864 So I will make it as Probably we don't know for the last year. Only for this year we'll take it. Three seven nine six eight six point four something. So which means this is the 
dividend yield. This is the actual scenario. If you are putting 1 rupee with the company, if you are buying one share for 1 rupee, you are getting 0.58 paisa in the form of dividend. Which is much, much lesser, right? Even if you put in a bank deposit, you will get, for 1 rupee, you will get 5 paisa as a dividend, which is the return. Whereas here it is getting 0.58 paisa only. The remaining, you may have to look at it with respect to share price increase. If the share price increases by at least another 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 percent, overall your position is better. But if the share price increases only by 1 or 2 percent, then overall you are getting 2.58 paisa, which is a very bad thing, which is not worth the investment for you to do. Dividend? What the investors are being given? No, the, the, the dividend given as a percentage of profit. If the company generated 100, per, 100 rupees as a profit, how much of it is given as a dividend? How much of it is retained back in the business? The investor, today if you buy one share of the company, this is the dividend that is coming to you. 0.58% of your money. So it's like you, you put 100 rupees in a bank, you are getting 104. You put 100 rupees in Dr. Reddy's, you are getting 100.58. If the share price does not grow, you are getting only 100.58 after one year. That is what is the dividend talking about. So, assured amount that you are getting from the company is only 0.58%. Remaining is risky depending on how the stock price goes up or goes down. The guaranteed amount is 0.58%. The remaining is unguaranteed. You may get more, you may get less. That is purely based on the stock price of the company. So, typically if uh, the, the company's performance is viewed at as positive, then the stock price increases. More people will buy the share in the market. So, the stock price increases. So, probably if you are already holding it, if you sell it, probably your overall return is increasing. Otherwise, your overall return is falling on the market. Then the most important thing which uh, people look at is earnings per share, which is nothing but PAT divided by number of shares. Per share, how much profit is the company generating? Because only, that, that's the max you can be given, right? Per share, how much profit did the company generate? Which is nothing but PAT divided by number of shares. How do I find out the number of shares? Face value is 5 rupees per share. And this is the market capitalization. So, divide this by this, you will get the number of shares. Because share price multiply, oh sorry, share price multiplied by number of shares is the market capitalization. So, if I want number of shares, I can do market capitalization divided by the share price, not the face value. Market capitalization divided by the share price, what is the share price here it is shown, right? 2235. It is shown as the share price 2235.6. So, what I can do is I, to find out uh, the number of shares, I can do it as I can do this number 379686.4 divided by the share price, whatever it is. 2235.6. So almost 169 million shares are there. So what is the profit did the company generate per share? So I can look at it as this 
divided by this number. Oh, sorry. This number. So, it is saying for every one share, the company has generated 53 rupees profit. Share price into number of shares equal to market capitalization. You are finding number of shares as market capitalization divided by the share price. This is the formula. So, this is what the company has generated as a profit per one share, which means if you are buying a share, let's say for 2200 rupees today, the profit the company is generating is 53 rupees. So, assuming the whole profit is given to you also, you are getting 53 rupees per share. So, how much, what is your return you are getting per share? 53 rupees. Divided by 2200, whatever is the share price, 2235, whatever it is, you are getting 2.3% profit. If you buy the share today at this price, even if the company is giving everything in the form of, whatever the profit it has generated in the form of dividend, still your return for the year is only 2.37%. So, the higher the number is, those companies are more preferred by the investors. Right? Only if the company can generate more profit, probably even if it doesn't pay me, I can reinvest it back into the company and it can result in growth of the business and if not this year, next year I will get. But if the profit itself is not a big number, in the future also where can I expect to get a bigger one? Right? So, that's where EPS is a very important aspect from the company's standpoint. And price to earnings ratio, every one publishes on a daily basis. So, here it is something 30 at this moment. The higher the number is, the riskier the company is. I mean, the, there's no point if the number keeps increasing, which means, Compared to the profit, if the company has generated 1 rupee profit, because denominator is profit, price to earnings. Earnings are nothing but PAT. Probably you can write it as price divided by PAT. So, <coughs> the price, so if the PAT is 1 rupee, which means the profit of the company is 1 rupee, People are paying 30 rupees for it to buy that share, which is also the other way. For every 30 rupees which you are putting, you are getting 1 rupee profit. So, how much? You are getting 3% return. 1 by 30. For every 30 rupees you are investing, the company is generating 1 rupee profit. So, for every 100 rupees, you are getting 3 rupees profit. So, 3% is the approximate return which you are getting on the company. So, the higher is this ratio, it is an indicator of overvalued. Already the price is very high for the company. If you have it, better sell it off. If the price is, if this ratio is lesser, we'll talk about undervalued. Please invest in that particular company. A simple measure, even without looking at so many stuff, from the market perspective, if I have to make a decision, I will simply look at this price to earnings ratio, which is nothing but for every 30 rupees which I am putting, because this is nothing but numerator is 30. For every 30, which is the price which I am putting in the company, the company is generating a profit of 1 rupee. So, at the most, I am getting around 3% profit. 30 rupees is my investment, 1 rupee is my profit. 
So I am getting a profit of around 3%. Again, you take the market price. So this is always published. It's on a dynamic basis. It is always published here. You can pick up from the sources directly and you can analyze it at regular points in time. Right? So, from various dimensions, of course, there is no end to it. The financial analysis will take days and days to typically uh, uh, cover up various multiple dimensions. But as a first notch, if you have to analyze the financial statement of the company, this is the typical process which is being followed. So, from various, again, if you have to go in depth into each of these things, again, each one has around 15, 20 different kinds of ratios to look at. And that gives the, because the investment angle is completely with a thorough analysis of ratios from multiple dimensions itself. Right? 